God sabbat. Hjertelig velkommen til gudstjeneste. Jeg skal si bare noen innledende ord før den går i gang. Jeg er spesielt velkommen til gjester som vi har her i dag. Filippinske adventister fra hele Norden har satt seg stevne på Tyrefjord fra torsdag og til søndag. Og i dag er det de som skal ha programmet her i sin helhet. Programmet vil foregå på engelsk, men det vil bli oversatt til norsk. Så hvis du vil ha en norsk oversettelse og enda ikke har fått headset, så kan du få det enten ved døra ute der, eller så bak ved miksepulten. Det er eget barnemøte inn på klasserom K, så det er eget gudstjeneste for barna der inne. I want to wish a warm welcome to all the Filippinians who are visiting Tirifjord in these days. I hope that you already are enjoying your stay here. And the local church here at Tirifjord really look forward to worship together with you this Sabbath morning. There, as you already may know, there is a uh, service for the children at Classroom K uh, on the other side. Kollekten i dag går som vi har satt på programmet til Tyrefjord barn- og ungdomsskole, så den vil bli tatt opp underveis. The offerings today will go to the local church school located 200-300 meter from here. And we are really blessed uh, that you will give your offerings to our uh, church school. Now I leave the rest of the program for the Filipino group. Good morning and happy Sabbath. And I hope everybody find their comfortable seats. And today is a very special Sabbath. Extra special because this program is to be led by Fana, which is Filipino Adventist in Nordic areas. So as I call your country, representing your country, would you please stand so you will be recognized by our visitors as well. Uh, may I call on first a representative from Finland? In Norway, thank you. And the least but not the, the, the last, the Denmark team. And the Sweden as well, sorry. Okay, and that is our Filipino Adventist in Nordic areas. And today we have our special guest because we, our program here would not be possible without our resource speaker. I have to introduce to you if he is around, would you please stand if I call your name? He is an ordained minister, worked for five years in the Philippines and two years in South Korea. He also ministered in different churches, in North England Conference, and was appointed as chaplain of the Harper Bell School in Birmingham, England. Would you please welcome Dan Mahadoko. Is he around? And we have also another resource speaker. A traveling speaker from Europe, he has received training and done extensive study on the topics of the Bible, especially its prophecies. Daniel and his wife, Sylvia, run Living Water Ministry dedicated to proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Would you please stand if you're around, Pastor Daniel Peel and her beautiful wife, Sylvia. Thank you, and we would like to thank you, the, our host for this final, the Norway, the Norway Filipino group for the, the successful of this event, who planned this wonderful place for us to stay, especially mentioned our very own Ati Oni and brother Billy. 
So thank you, and I hope you will all be blessed by the messages and the songs that we will be hearing for today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. I am, I am inviting everyone to lift each of their voices as we sing praises to the Lord in our sing inspiration. For our first song, let us sing, We Gather Together, hymn number eight in the SDA hymnal. Just be seated, please. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessings. He chastens and raises His will to make known the wicked oppressing. Now cease from distressing. Sing praises to His name. He forgets not His own. Beside us to guide us, our God, with us joining, ordaining, maintaining His kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, now Lord, we're at our side. All glory be thine. We all to extol thee, thou leader triumphant, and pray that thou still our defender wilt be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation. Thy name be ever praised. Our next song, hymn number 524, It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the said the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me near the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking. Life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I 
trust Him. Thou art moved in more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, of our grace to trust Him more. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Hymn number 73 for our entry. Praise the Lord at this point of time for this holy Sabbath. God rested on the seventh day. He sanctified and worshipped. And we are very fortunate and blessed because we have a rest day to praise God and to gather in this church. And as we continue praising the Lord on this second service, may each of us set aside our worldly thinking, our worldly business. Let's give our full attention, 100% attention to the Lord as we receive the bread of life. I would like to read John chapter 4, verse 22 to 23. It says, Yet a time is coming, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in his spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is his spirit, and his worshipers must worship in his spirit and in truth. May God bless us. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. as we sing before Jehovah's awful throne first stanza for our doxology before your throne of grace, Heavenly Father, because we know that you are our creator, and we are your created beings. We thank you so much that we are alive today. We thank you for the shelter 
the clothing, the food that we eat. We thank you and we praise you. And this is the purpose why we come here today, to give you praise and adoration and worship. Me as we sing, me as we pray, me as we study your word, that all of this will be accepted in your sight, that you will accept our worship, and as we bring our bodies as a living sacrifice to you. Thank you that you are here, and we welcome your presence. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before we receive the tithes and offerings, let me read the, a text from the Bible in the book of Malachi 3.10. It says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not true open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that you will not have room enough for it. Now, the deaconesses are ready to serve. Gracious and kind, loving Father, we are very much thankful for the countless blessings you gave to us every day. Bless these tithes and offerings that it may give a big support for financial assistance to the ministry. Dear God, we humbly ask you to continue to sustain our jobs and daily income so we can support our daily needs and most especially to help other people who are hungry of spiritual needs. 
This is our prayer to you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing the theme song, Each One, Reach One. Let's all stand for our scripture reading. Uh, we will be reading in different languages and dialects. We will be reading the, our scripture reading, which is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. We will be reading it in Norwegian, in Danish, in Finnish, in Swedish, in Tagalog, Cebuano, Bicol, Ilocano, Ilongo, Pampango, and in English. Let us all rise as we listen to the scripture reading. Bibel text ni dag ar hentit fra Lucas kapitel 10 vers 28. Jag läser i Jesu namn. Han svarte, du skall elske Herren din Gud av hela ditt hjärta och av hela din själ och av all din kraft och av, och av all din förstan och din nästa som dig själv. Då sa Jesus, du svarte rätt, gör det. Så skal du leve. First listening is Kriftina Finis i Lukas 10, 20, 8, 10. Så hans vær og sag, 
Dus kan elke heren dit goed, en vele dit jaren, of en vele dit schil, en vele dit strikken, of en vele dit zien. O die nesten som die ze, o hen zei te hem, du hart waard rijdt, God, o dus kan lief. Pus Bengske, Hans Varede, Duske Elsa Herr in den Gud, ab Hila dit Jarta, um mit Hila den Quell, um mit dit Hila den Kraft, um mit dit, mit Hila dit Verstand, und den nächsten zum Dei Quell. Hans Sade, dit a Red, Jorde, so for the Liebe. Han was the sea ya sanoi. Rakasta hera, sinun yumalasi. Kai kesta suda mistasi. Ya kai kesta stia lustasi. Ya kai kesta voy mustasi. Ya kai kesta mielestasi. Ya lahimaistasi. Nin kuen itsiasi. Han sanoi hanile. Oi kien was the sit. Dese nin sina sat ella. At pagsagot niya sinabi, ibigin mo ang Panginoon, mong Diyos ng buong puso mo at ang buong kaluluwa mo at ng buong lakas mo at ng buong pag-iisip mo at ng iyong kapwa na gaya ng iyong sarili. At sinabi niya sa kanya, matuwid ang sagot mo, gawin mo ito at mabubuhay ka. Ang magtutudlo sa balaod mitubag. Higugma ang ginoo ng imong Dios sa tibuok mong kasing-kasing, ug sa tibuok mong kalag, ug sa tibuok mong kusog, ug sa tibuok mong hunahuna. Ug higugma ang imong isig kataw, ingon sa paghigugma mo sa imong kaugalingon. Mitubag si Hesus, husto ang imong tubag. Buhata ka na ug makadawat ka sa kinabuhi. Lucas Kapitulo 10, versikulo 97 hasta 98. Nagsimbag ang lalaki, kamutan mo ang kagurangnan mong Diyos sa bilog mong puso, sa bilog mong kalag, sa bilog mong kusog, asin sa bilog mong isip. Kamutan mo manan sa imong kapwa, sirikan pagkamot mo sa, sari, sa diri mo. Tama ang simbag mo. Ang sabi ni Jesus, giboha iyan, asin mabubuhay ka. Ket iso si mungbat akinunana. Ayatem ti apu at Diyos mo. Iti iso amin na pusom, ken ito iso amin na kararwam, ken kadag iti amin nga pigsam, ken iti amin nga isip mo, ken iti kaarubam akas iti bagim. Ket kinunana ken kuana, nalinteg ti isunsungbat mo. Aramidem da itoy, ketagbiag kanto. Nagsabat ang tao, higugmaam ang imo ginoo, sa imo Diyos, sa bugos mo nga tagipusoon, sa bugos mo nga kalag, sa tanan mo nga ginahimo, kag sa bugos mo nga huna-huna, kag higugmaon mo ang imo kapariho, pariho sa pagigugma mo sa imo kaugalingon. Nagseling si Jesus sa iya, husugid ang imo sabat, himua inaagod, may kabuhi ka nga wala sing katapusan. Kaya nga mano pong kapampangan, may kibat ya, sukat meng lugaran ing ginung kay kang Diyos, king mabilog mong puso, king mabilog mong kaladwa, king mabilog mong sikanan, at king mabilog mong kaisipan, at sukat meng lugaran ing kalupa mong tao ang timo kay kang sarili. Nga nang Jesus, gusto yung pakibat mo, daptan mo iti at mimyeka. The man replied, The scriptures say, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. They also say, Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Jesus said, You have given the right answer. If you do this, 
you will have eternal life. Shall we all kneel for prayer? My task this blessed Sabbath day is to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is an ordained minister, worked for five years in the Philippines and two years in South Korea. He also ministered in different churches in North England Conference and was appointed as chaplain of the Harper Bell School in Birmingham, England. Our speaker, uh, the name of our speaker is Pastor Dan Mahadukon. He has one wife and one son. Presently, he is living in England with his wife. Now we are to pray for our speaker that God will going to use him again this blessed Sabbath day. But before we're going to speak, you would like to request uh, the Fana Mass Cry. We're going to sing for our special song.
the the Philippines is made up of 1,107 islands, and they speak 47 languages and 52 dialects. 7,107 islands. 47 languages, 52 dialects, and they were just so kind to you to speak only the, during the scripture reading for a few of those languages, or else you will be standing forever. <laughs> it is a pleasure, it is a privilege to be here. It's my first time to be in this country, a very nice country, very clean, very fresh. And it's very refreshing to be here. Thank you so much. And of course, we are very thankful to the administrators uh, in this conference to have allowed um, this group of young people uh, to do their retreat here in order to encourage one another and to refresh their spiritual need. And uh, that the fellowship and have themselves satisfied with the Word of God. Defining or Becoming is the title of the sermon, and it's actually, the focus is uh, reaching out or evangelism through the story of Jesus that is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Our Heavenly Father, you know me so well, more than I ever know myself. And I pray, Father, that you will hide me behind the cross today, so that only Jesus will be magnified and glorified. Thank you, Father, that you will be with us all, and that you are going to touch our hearts and minds and our ears, so that we will clearly see and hear and understand your message for us. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. One day, a lawyer, one who professed to be well-skilled in the laws of Moses and whose business was to explain them, decides to have a brain power match with Jesus. He wants to challenge Jesus' ability of the Scripture. And so he begins the conversation not with a trivial chit-chat or very unimportant chit-chat, but jumps in right into a deep question. He asks Jesus, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That is not an easy question. And so, however, Jesus answers his question with a question. What is written in the law? How do you interpret it? And the lawyer thinks for a moment. His brain is processing. His brilliance in the Old Testament scripture is now at work and put to use. Well, there is one verse in Deuteronomy and another verse in Leviticus. And actually, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And therefore, this lawyer says, Well, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 28, Jesus says, bingo, you've got it. Do it, and you will inherit eternal life. But this is not what the lawyer has in mind. Here he is hopeful of demonstrating his profound scholarly knowledge. Therefore, Luke says, but he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, but who is my neighbor? 
Well, I know I need to love my neighbor, but who exactly is my neighbor? Can you define who it is? Define neighbor. There are people who are truly seekers for truth. And they ask because they are longing for some answers to the questions in their heart. But this kind of people are sincere and, and they are open to God to pour out for more into them. But here is a person who asks not to seek the answer he doesn't know, but simply to showcase his ability and his scholarly learning. After all, he is a doctor of the law and Jesus never went to school. <clears throat> but Jesus persists in keeping the debate in a very simple level. And this is the start of the parable of the Good Samaritan, which we all know very well. Jesus says, there was a man traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is a 17-mile hike downhill, all the way literally as well as figuratively. It's downhill literally because Jerusalem is about 2,600 feet high above sea level, while Jericho is about 700 feet below sea level. So if you're coming from Jerusalem, going down to Jericho, you are really trotting your steps down. It's a downhill 17-mile hike. It's downhill figuratively and also literally because Jerusalem to Jericho Road was a notoriously dangerous stretch of road infested by raiding gangs. The main road from Jerusalem to Jericho follows down through a portion of dry, barren, uninhabited hills of the wilderness of Judah. And the entire region, with its many caves, with its many rocks, provides a perfect hideout for outlaws. In fact, Professor Hackett, writing in 1852, that is about 1,820 years after Jesus gave the parable, he says that no part of the traveler's journey is so dangerous as the expedition to Jericho and the Dead Sea. The Oriental pilgrims who repair to the Jordan have the protection of an escort of Turkish soldiers, and others who would make the same journey must either go in company with them or provide for their safety by procuring a special guard. The place derives its hostile character from its terrible wildness and desolation. The ravines, the almost inaccessible cliffs, the caverns furnace admirable lurking places for robbers, and they can rush forth unexpectedly upon their victims and escape as soon almost beyond the possibility of pursuit. Now, you may ask, why and where are these robbers coming from? You see, Jesus' story speaks to them so vividly and so clear that they can relate to them because Jesus is using illustration common to their lives and common occurrences. And where are these robbers coming from, you may ask? Well, Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, says that at one time, Herod the Great dismissed 40,000 men who had been employed in building the temple, and a large part of whom became highwaymen. Now, these highwaymen, of course, doesn't mean road workers fixing the roads, but they are the unemployed, the jobless, who resort to become thieves for survival or maybe for more money. And so the inevitable happens. The hiker gets held up. In today's version, they take his wallet. They take his ID, his cash, his credit cards, and even his clothes, and leave him there along beside the road in his trousers, unconscious, black and blue, and bleeding. I believe this man tries to resist. He must be carrying with him some cash or valuables. 
He tries to resist because unlike today, before there are no insurances for personal belongings. Now, Jericho was a uh, sacerdotal city. It means that there are priests and that are going up from Jericho to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to Jericho again after their assignments are done. The passing of priests and Levites between the place Jerusalem and Jericho in that road was an everyday occurrence. Now a priest comes by and happens to see this poor specimen of humanity lying at the side of the road. What is he going to do? We all know that the priest, the spiritually inclined who entirely misses the point of religion, takes a wide detour. He went a different route, bypassing the man. This is what we've always known since the beginning. We know already the priest did that, but do you know the reason why? Somebody says, perhaps... He is going to lecture the topic, how to win friends and influence people. In front of a 500 audience, and he cannot afford to be light. Therefore, he must make a detour and leave the man. Perhaps he was going to make sure that he will be able to answer the question of some visitors posted in the church Facebook account about the direction to the church. Oh, sorry, there was no Facebook before. But seriously, though. Here is the answer. Numbers chapter 19, verse 16. And whosoever touches one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean. How many days? You've got to be kidding me. Seven days? If I touch this man, I'm going to be unclean for seven days? How can I perform my function in the synagogue? A little while later, a Levite comes by. And the Levite, though not a priest, though not a priest, he is a person with significant religious responsibilities. A Levite's tasks include keeping the temple gates, caring for the courts and chambers of the sanctuary, maintaining the treasury, singing. And he is the police of the temple. But he too, he too decides not to let this unpleasantness interrupt his business, his schedule of the day. Someone else would come along at any moment to help this guy. So the question about not helping is, if not us, who? If not now, when? And then come along, comes along, along comes, well, you fill in the blank. Jesus with a carefully calculated character in the story to shock his listeners purposely comes up with a questionable human being. He says, along comes a Samaritan. A who? A Samaritan. I don't know if you have discovered in your Bible how much the Jews hate the Samaritans. But they hate the Samaritans so much that at one time when they were very angry at Jesus, they call him a Samaritan. Here it is. John 8, 48 and 49. The people told Jesus, we were right to say that you are a Samaritan and that you have a demon in you. Jesus answered, I don't have a demon in me. You see, if they are extremely angry at you, they will call you a Samaritan, just like a Muslim who would call you a pig if he is angry at you. And who are the Samaritans? Well, a little bit of a history helps. They are half Jewish and half God knows what. You remember that Israel was divided into two after King Solomon died. Israel was divided into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. And in fact, Judah became, Jerusalem became the capital of Judah, and, and Samaria became the capital of Israel. Now, the Syrians invaded the Samaria in Israel about 722 B.C., and the final credit of the victory was given to Sargon II, who carried the majority of the inhabitants of Samaria into the province of Syria. But then, 
there were few Jews, Jews remaining in Samaria. And then Sargon II imported now inhabitants coming from the province of Assyria to Samaria and the surrounding areas. And then they formed a new Samaritan population. Now, while they were there, these new people from Assyria settles in Samaria. You can find that in 2 Kings chapter 17. Relates that these new settlers there in Samaria were attacked by lions. And because of this incident, interpreting this to mean that their worship was not acceptable to the deity, to the God of the land, that is Samaria of the Jews, they asked Sargon II to send someone to teach them about the God of the land, that is Jehovah, and which Sargon did. Sargon sent a Hebrew priest to teach them about law. The Assyrians followed most of the Jewish teachings. They became Assyrians, converted into Judaism. However, they did not understand conversion very well because many of them still have their own gods to maintain. But to the remaining Jews, that was good enough. Assyrians converted to Judaism, that was good enough. So they intermarried with them. The result was a mixture of religions and people. In the time of Jesus Christ, the Samaritans did not differ much from that of the Jews. For with them, they accepted the five books of Moses. They also accepted that the Messiah is to come. I think you remember well the Samaritan woman at the well. John 4, 25. The woman said, I know that the Messiah will come. He is the one we call Christ. When he comes, he will explain to us everything. Thank you. But the thing is, they insisted that believed that the holy place, the temple where they should worship was this temple built in Mount Gerizim in a place called Shechem. While the Jews insist that is the temple, the holy place should be at the temple in Jerusalem, not Mount Gerizim. And this passion for one holy place or another was enough to divide them bitterly. I've got into thinking why Jesus used the Samaritan with foreign blood running in his veins as a hero of the story. Why does Jesus, speaking to Jewish audiences, make this foreigner, this mongrel, be the hero of the story? I believe there is a reason that he wants to come across. Do you remember Matthew chapter 1, that boring chapter, that begot, begot, begot chapter in Matthew 1? The genealogy of Jesus or the pedigree of Jesus. Matthew listed two foreign women as Jesus' grandmothers. Who were they again? It was Ruth the Moabite and Rahab from Jericho. And they were Jesus' grandmothers. Really? Yes. Jesus lists in his genealogy, he has two foreigners on it. Who were they? Again, Ruth the Moabite and Rahab of Jericho. But Ruth was a gleaner and Rahab was a harlot. Jesus' list of grandmothers in Matthew 1. Now, let's dig a little bit more about Ruth the Moabite. Moab is the father of the Moabites, if you remember. Moab is the son of Lot, if you remember, with his incestuous union with his eldest daughter inside the cave when his daughters raped him while he was drunk. The result of that ugly incident was Moab. And the descendants are the Moabites. And so to the Jews, it is not an auspicious beginning. This is not a very good beginning. If you tell them that you are a Moabite, all they will recall in their mind is that Lot was raped by his daughters. And you are the son of an ugly incident. Maybe it would help you to know that Moab was where Sodom and Gomorrah were located. The Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in fact, forbids the Jews from associating with the Moabites. But here is Ruth the Moabite, the foreigner. Ruth coming from Moab with Naomi, if you remember the story. And now in his trial, she must scratch 
a living from the spare, neglected corners of the economy. She was what they called the ancient rural equivalent of the street people today in your city who raid the corners of the city for their garbage. Foreigners wash the restaurant dishes, the empty, the bed pans, the clean, the hotel rooms, wash the towels and the restaurant dishes, they pick the strawberries and the oranges, some of them nanny your children. Anything citizens born in this country refuse to do. Ruth the Moabite, the foreigner, must scratch living from the spare, neglected corners of the economy. Ruth, though, became a grandmother of King David. And Jesus is the son of David, according to Matthew 1. What he means to tell us is that King David has the blood of the Jewish arch enemies running in his veins. Go back far and enough. And King David comes from Sodom and Gomorrah. King David has the blood of a Moabite, has the blood of a Gentile. He is mongrel. What about Rahab? Well, you know, she's a harlot. She was a Gentile prostitute. You see, times, at times God uses saints and prophets. But sometimes he wants to show us that he can use even sinners. Not only God use them, he can save them. And Jesus' lineage in Matthew is telling us that without Ruth the Moabite, without Rahab the harlot from Jericho, without these foreigners, you can never have King David nor King Jesus. Matthew 1 says, no foreigner, no Christ. It's as simple as that. The Jews despised the Samaritans, cursed them in their temple, but Jesus, in all his speech and in all his actions, Tell us that every human being is an heir to a legacy of dignity and worth. That the image of God is shared equally in equal proportion by all human beings. That there is no graded scale or essential worth. That every human being has etched in his or her character the indelible stamp of the Creator. Don't let anybody fool you that because you cannot speak the language fluently yet, that because you are a foreigner, you are less worth than anyone else. You are a child of God. And you've got to hold your head up and tell proudly everybody that you are a child of God and share the good news. Yes, you are. And so Jesus emphasizes that the priest and the Levite didn't help Along comes the foreigner, the Samaritan. This is a choice, carefully calculated character in the story. Along comes a Samaritan, and as he passes by, he stops. And as he stops, he touches this person lying there wounded. Touches him, soothes him, put bandages on him, put him on his donkey, takes him to an inn, pays for whatever he needs. A priest, a Levite, a Samaritan. Now we understand how meaningful and how challenging, how powerful and how thought-provoking this parable is to the hearers of Jesus. Where do we fall? Where do we fit of these three characters in the story? Are you the priest? Are you the Levite? Are you the Samaritan? The Samaritan spent not just money, but his personal time and energy to help the man. A few years ago, a couple of psychologists concocted a little recreation of the Good Samaritan story. They invited 40 seminary students to give a little talk about their call for the ministry. And to do that, they have to leave one building, cross the street, and go into another building where they are going to be tape recorded in their talk about their call to the ministry. On the way, the psychologist planted an actor, a man begging for help. And out of 40 seminary students, do you know how many helped? Only two. It's like saying, uh -oh. Get out of my way. I've got to serve the Lord. 
I've got to talk about my calling, so don't disturb me. We thought we're so busy loving God, but realized that somehow we've missed out some point because we have no more love left for Jane or Joe who lives next door. Religion is often a distraction from rather than an impulse toward justice, mercy, and charity. As what evangelist uh, Bill has rightly put it last night, that religion becomes a subculture, that it creates a wall in itself, that it no longer becomes effective in reaching out to others. And tragically, many Christians are content just to enjoy their own safe place, in Jesus' lifeboat, we fellowship with our lifeboat comrades, sing our lifeboat songs, and make our ways to make our lifeboat bigger and better and more comfortable. Many think just church is just like a cruise ship. People in the church who think that church is a cruise ship are just having a good time. They're not serious about growing. They're not serious about witnessing, about producing, about sharing. They're not serious about developing. It's just a cruise ship. They just meet, they just greet, they eat, they are full, they burp, and they leave. Come back next time again. Meet, greet, eat, burp, and leave. And that's it. The religion of the priest and the Levite is not beneficent. It's not even benign. It's precisely their religion that keeps them from doing their religious duty. The priests and the Levites are not evil. They are just focused. But unfortunately, it is wrongly focused. And here comes the Samaritan. Jesus was a Jew, and he loved the Jews. He loved Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the rest. But unfortunately, his words were, Along came a Samaritan. If we are going to contextualize with all honesty to some degree and to some respect, it is the non-Adventist that Jesus referred to as the good Samaritan in the story. Here comes, along comes a Mormon, so to speak. Along comes a Jehovah's Witness, so to speak. People often despise them because of their outlandish teachings or maybe their persistence to take some of your time. But they intentionally set aside time and energy to reach out others and faithfully knock on the doors and even sometimes to the Adventist door because they believe that inside those doors, souls are dying and they need a Savior. Fana... Um, members, uh, the challenge is for us to pray for one another. You can start maybe by engaging in a prayer ministry where when you come, you have less pictures, but more on praying one another. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Well, my neighbor our neighbor is the person next to us, regardless of color, regardless of looks, regardless of religion or nationality, close enough for us to help and who is in need. That's the implication of the parable. But asking merely as to who is my neighbor is just superficial. Jesus presented in this little story so he could ask the question, which of these three was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Who do you think? The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? The answer is clear. Yes, the Samaritan. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. And don't worry about defining neighbor. Just worry being one. This is what Jesus wants to put across. Don't focus on who your neighbor is. Don't focus on them whether they are good or bad or whether they disturb your love or not. The only focus is on you. Are you being a good neighbor? Are you a neighbor? Don't worry about defining neighbor. Just worry being one. It doesn't matter whether they're Catholic or Alliance or Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Lutheran. It doesn't matter whether they're agnostics or atheists or cold or snobbish. You've got to reach out. Definition often prevents action. 
And Jesus looks with the same eye, the same love and sympathy at everyone, regardless of their nationality and religion. We have been called to share love. Do not spend your time focusing on who they are, but on who are, you are to them. I know you came here, especially I'm talking to the Filipinos. You came here to work and not to be missionaries. But once we see clearly how God loves us, and how he esteems us, and how he adopted us as his sons and daughters. We hold up our head up high, and we say, I'm a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I've got to get myself up. I am no longer timid. I am no longer fearful. I am no longer, you know, half-hearted. I've got to serve my God even in this part of the world. He has a purpose for me here. I am willing to be used by him. The truth of the matter is, Jesus is the Good Samaritan. We have been wounded by sin, but he came to rescue us, pick us up, bound our wounds, carried us, placed us in a safe place, and healed our wounds so we can continue the journey. Life, my friends, is a journey, and part of your journey is here in Europe. We have different professions. We have different lives. We all are different, but we are all God's children. And when you are in Christ, you are the ambassador for Christ. You may be a nurse or a student or a teacher, a health worker or an office worker or a manager. Life is a journey, and we are all on the Jericho Road. And if you open your eyes, there are many opportunities to serve. Once we were helpless, helpless and wounded, but Jesus came to rescue us. Now it's our turn. And these opportunities are planted by God along the highway of our lives. And God is looking to see if we will take notice of them. Time will come that these opportunities will be accounted for. The sermon is finished, and I am going to make a very specific appeal. If you are a non-Adventist and you come here to join because an Adventist friend has invited you, but God is speaking to you today clearly in this conference, in these meetings that we have, that you need to study more God's Word. And that you have realized through the power of the Holy Spirit, He sp speaks to you, that you need to dig a little deeper in His Word because it is your desire to have a closer walk with God. You don't plan. You don't plan to become an Adventist. No, you don't. But you want to know God more. So you want to receive a free Bible study. If you are that person that the Holy Spirit speaks to, I would like to ask you to stand. If you are in this auditorium and you are here today, you are not an Adventist. You don't plan to be yet. But you just want to have a closer walk with Jesus and you want to study His God's Word and you want to receive a Bible study. If you are that person and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, I want you to stand. Is there anybody here wants to receive a Bible study. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, please don't deny or reject it. Is there anyone, anybody in this auditorium who wants to dig a little deeper into God's Word and to know Him further, personally? Let me stand at the moment. My second appeal goes to discouraged Adventists. You are an Adventist, you've been here in this part of the world, but somehow your walk with Him grew cold. 
But this conference here, God spoke to you that you need to give up and shake your worldliness away and be committed to Him again. If you are that person, you are that person, you are in this country, you have a solid ground before, but now your foundation seems they are eroding and you want to commit yourself again to Jesus, I would like you to stand. If you are here today, God speaks to you today. Kindly stand. Jesus said, that if you deny me, I cannot represent to you in heaven. But if you stand for me, I will be proud to stand with you in front of my Father and the holy angels. Thank you very much. You see, the earth is not our final journey. Even 1,000 years in heaven is just like a snap of a finger. It's like a nanosecond of eternity. Our life on earth is uncertain. Once it's over, it's over. The next thing we know is the face of Jesus. You've got to serve the Lord with all your heart. And so thank you so much that you recommend your lives to you. Let us bow down our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, you're the one who reads our thoughts and our intentions, our hearts. I pray, Father, that as these precious souls, your sons and daughters, stood up today, to indicate their commitment to follow you all the way. I pray, Father, that you are going to give them the strength in order to make that commitment a possibility. I pray, Father, that you are going to let your light shine in their eyes and that they are going to see the light of Jesus Christ and His righteousness so that the things in this world would strangely grow strangely dim in comparison to the light of Jesus Christ. Give them the power to overcome evil, Father. And I pray that you will strengthen them, that they will become a light into their community, even to their families, to their husbands, their spouses, and their wives, their children because that is what you wanted them to. And so thank you so much, Father, that you forgive our sins and you will heal our sicknesses. And you will provide for us the living water, the bread of life, so that we will be full and be filled and that we will have that joy to share it to others. Give us that courage, Father. And so thank you so much that you hear this prayer. I pray in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. God bless.
for our hymn of consecration. Each one, reach one. Can win our world for Jesus. 
Jesus Christ for each one can reach one as we follow after Christ we all can lead one we can lead one to the Savior and together we can tell the world that Jesus is the way if we one, reach one, if we each one, reach one. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that Jesus came and reached us out all. And may we reach out to others too with his strength and with his love. Dismiss us with your blessing and protection, we pray in your name. Amen.
like to take, thank you, our great Lord, and all the Filipino group for the blessings given to us this, uh, at this service. Thank you for sharing the message and your inspiration through words and music. Thank you, Pastor uh, Maya Duken, for the challenge you gave us at your sermon. Uh, may God bless you all as you leave to Urifjord after these days. And welcome back as a group and as individuals. Tack, tusen tack til alle sammen som har vært her i dag. Ønsker dere fortsatt en god sabbat. Og husk at det alltid er gudstjeneste på sabbaten i Tyrifjord menighet. Velkommen tilbake. We are inviting everyone to please join us at the cafeteria for our lunch. Uh, foods have been prepared for everyone and we can enjoy the fellowship of one another while we are enjoying the blessings of the food that is given us. Happy Sabbath once again. See you at the cafeteria.